And welcome back, boys and girls, for another special edition of the Michael Deacon Program. Good morning and good evening to all of you around the world. It feels incredible to be back, as always. Please go to michaeldeacon.com and sign up for our newsletter. That means disable your pop-up blocker and sign up. For those of you who found this primarily on YouTube, keep in mind, you too can take us on the road with you. Just search the Michael Deacon Program and voila, we're there. Joining me in a moment is Brad Olson. He is the author of 10 books, including the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and Beyond Esoteric. He's an award-winning author, publisher, and event producer whose captivating presentations have engaged audiences worldwide. Now, without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Brad Olson. And uh, joining me right now is Mr. Brad Olson. How are you? Hey, Michael, I'm doing great. Nice to be back on the Michael Deacon program. You got it. Yes. Welcome back. Thanks for stopping in. And of course, the last time you were here, we were discussing some things you had in store for your appearance over at Contact in the Desert. And of course, so much has occurred in such a short time. And, you know, we'll go through all these sort of things. But first and foremost, welcome back to the program. Always a honor and pleasure. And I hope you enjoyed your time over at Contact in the Desert, by the way. Yeah, that was a great event. Always a pleasure to see you there and get caught up. We uh, hung out a couple times, uh, talked about things we always talk about, Michael. It's just, we could be uh, doing it on the Michael Deacon program or we could be doing it over a drink. It's fun to uh, connect with people and such a setting as Contact in the Desert at the Renaissance Hotel, beautiful venue, and among so many other like-minded people. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And by the way, one of our mutual friends, he had told me something about some sort of um, incident that happened over at Contact in the Desert right around 2015, I believe in relation to directed energy weapons by the way brad someone's yeah, claiming that the, they were hit by hit by one yes yeah, so the basically they're lasers directed energy weapons dues is the acronym we've heard them come up a lot lately in the alternative media because after the very anomalous maui fires with photo evidence of them beaming down and igniting the, there's a lot more interest in this subject, a lot more knowledge and awareness. And people are also posting quite a bit on the patents for directed energy weapons and videos and documentaries about how they work. So they're right. very real technology. The big question is, how is it that they're being used on their own people? And that would be the case in Maui and the California and other wildfires. There is an element within the deep state that we hear so much about, this cabal, that has some of these three-letter agencies as their enforcement arm. And they're using these fires as a way of the, directing the Hegelian dialectic, the problem-reaction-solution. And here we are again with another 9-11 type uh, incident, incident which, right. by the way, Michael, a lot of people now believe that there were dues used on 9-11 to take down the Twin Towers. Yes, so and, and by the way, all, can, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, and by the way, that where I was getting uh, that information was from Alfred Weber, who was stating that something had happened to some attendee back in uh, 2015 at Contact in the Desert. Hit by a due? Yeah, that's what they're claiming. Mm. Do you know who that person was? I don't exactly I know who it was personally but I, I believe alfred weber i think he knows who that individual is it'd be interesting to talk to them again yeah it would to get their experience because otherwise when you get hit by one of these larger military grade dues you can pretty much be vaporized and burned alive to the point where there's not much left than just your skeleton and that's what they're saying in maui that the fires burn so hot uh, almost 2000 degrees hotter than a normal brush fire, wildfire, which is claimed that's what was the fuel source, is just burning some dry trees and bushes. But they uh, authorities even claim that the Maui fires got up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, that doesn't sound normal at all, by the way. Not at all. Not at all. So the heat is the giveaway. The heat is the anomalous excessive heat 
on a lot of these incidents, which we're seeing now are false flag incidents, starting with 9-11. The heat is the giveaway that these towers, which were made out of reinforced concrete and steel, WTC 1 and 2, and the only heat source was the jet fuel. Well, jet fuel burns at about the same heat as a propane tank or a camp stove. So if the physics were to be believed on how those twin towers came down with the only fire accelerant being kerosene, jet fuel, well, geez, every single kerosene heater and propane tank stove would be at risk of collapsing into its own footprint, Michael. So heat is the dead giveaway, and that's also true with these do attacks. My goodness, I'm not quite sure if you have seen those photographs of the streets out there in Lahaina. I have, and Ooh. it's very sad. And, my, and it really goes out to all the, the victims, which is now growing into the thousands. Right. That number's not reported on, but that's how many kids have gone missing and uh, adults, 1,500 kids, have not checked into school since the fires. Yikes. So that number's pretty raw. Right, and as I said, so much has occurred in such a short time. UFOs took over the mainstream news for a while there. People were killed over in Maui due to wildfires, and the locals are looking for answers still today. Mm -hmm. Some say this was no accident, Brad, and it was all orchestrated. Well, it was, Michael, and when you have so many coincidences that it's no longer mathematically possible, the basic schematic of Lahaina is it's always been the capital of the Hawaiian Empire. It was called Lahaina Roads because the first sailors went there. It's the best port, calmest waters in the Hawaiian Islands. It's pretty much boxed in by Molokai and Lanai. And I lived in Lahaina for oh, wow. seven months. Yeah, in 1991, I was there uh, till I started getting island fever. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's true. After six months, you do start feeling very confined and my urge was to get off the island as soon as I could. But it's a gorgeous place, and I learned quite a bit about it, and I can tell you some of the history of Lahaina in a nutshell, and part of the reason why I think this particular community was targeted. Sure, why not? And uh, I, I'm not familiar with the area, but from what I read, it's super dry, very humid out there. Well, like all tall tropical islands, if, it, if they're over 5,600 feet, that's where the rain clouds get caught. So on the Big Island of Hawaii and also on uh, West Maui, which is where Lahaina is, and the island of Kauai, which is considered the r wettest spot in the world, which is right at 5,600. So it catches the rain clouds and it comes right down on top of the island of Kauai. But la la uh, West Maui and then the windward side of the Big Island and Haleakala Crater on Maui, mm -hmm. There's a, there's a band where it catches a lot of rain, and that's the wet side. It's true, Lahaina is on the dry side, just like Kona on the Big Island and um, the south shore of Kauai. There are dry sides and there are also wet sides. Uh, when I lived there, I, was, I, I joined this group of friends called the Comrades of Radical Excursions, or CORE. And we went around the island up and down and through Haleakala Crater, on these multi-day camping trips, adventure trips. And that's when I learned so much about the island, including all of the microclimates on Earth. 22 of them in total are all represented on the Big Island because they have frozen tundra and even uh, slight glaciers that can exist. But on Maui, it's 21 of these microclimates within the span of only 15 or 20 miles. It's really amazing how quickly the weather can change there. Oh, wow. Yes, I, um, I'm reading about it now as you were saying that. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Just an overabundance of variety, and that also goes with the flora and fauna. Anything can grow there because you've got pretty much any climate to grow in. So, for example, redwood trees, coastal redwoods, didn't grow ever in the tropics or the Hawaiian Islands. But when some of the early pioneer families uh, yeah. came over, they, they planted right. yeah, redwoods up in uh, upcountry of Maui, and they grow perfectly fine because it's the perfect uh, 
microclimate for them. Interesting. Yeah. So it's not native, obviously. No, not at all. Interesting. That's a beautiful place out there. It's terrible what happened. And we do have some listeners who are from around that area, last I heard. And the, unfortunately, last I heard, I haven't heard from them at all, Brad. So I'm a little worried. Oh, boy, if they lived in Lahaina. Yeah, I'm be. a little worried now. Because it was pretty much a wholesale burning out. It's more than just a land grab. It was also to take, dismantle the whole notion of Hawaii becoming an independent or sovereign nation. And Lahaina was going to be that capital, as it always has been in historic times. King Kamehameha, although from the Big Island, ruled from Maui. Maui's the most central point, especially West Maui in this Lahaina Roads area. And the roads just means that's a mariner term. You hear that a lot. For example, Road Town in the British Virgin Islands is the capital. It's not named after roads on the island. It's the sea lanes. It's the sea roads that lead there. Right. And so when you have safe harbor, it's always attracted merchants and then merchant marines who then, uh, of course, our military in Pearl Harbor, too, um, brings a lot of people from all around the world to the Hawaiian Islands. Yes. And Brad, I don't know if this was orchestrated. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but what we've seen, as you know, we, we have also seen this sort of thing before going back to 9-11. Yeah, we sure have. It, it, it's really sad. And I, as I said earlier, there how many coincidences before it's mathematically improbable? Correct. Let me just out all the data points for you and your listeners and just see if these are all just coincidences. Okay, first of all, wildfires of this kind are extremely rare in tropical islands such as this, because even on the dry side, you still get squalls of rain and it rains just about every day. I thought it was interesting that the problem reaction solution in the mainstream media was the problem. The climate change is drying out Maui so much that it could be a setup for wildfires. And then you get the wildfires were because of global warming, because it dried out so much. And then the solution, because after we have been burned out in Maui, the solution is that we have to uh, change our ways right. and convert <laughs> Maui into a 15-minute city island, which they're already proposing to do, to make this right. a smart island. Yes. Now, because Lahaina was a, it was a historic town, and there were beautiful old buildings down there, Pioneer Hotel to Front Street, the old customs house with an, one of the oldest living banyan trees, which I think did survive, yet it's white powder dust surrounding it on all sides, and as well as up the hill. So think of Lahaina Town as a T, a big T, with the long end of the T going up the hill. And then also up the hill on the West Maui Hills is the big letter L. And I rode my bike up there one time to check it out. And the upper town there is called Lahaina Luna. And the top one quarter did not get hit by anything. Those homes are still there, virtually the only homes in Lahaina. But everything below it has shown telltale signs of a controlled burn, not just dues though. I think they hit it in all these vectors. And there's a guy who's a realtor there. Of course, his business is devastated selling real estate in Maui. Nobody's going anymore. They wanna cancel their trips, but he's saying, come back, East Maui's open. His video series, Another Smoking Gun, Maui Fire Breaks Out, The Science as We Know It. He's going up to the neighborhood of Lahaina Luna, right where the fire started. And he's showing that these fires started out of nothing. There were no trees there. In one case, he's going over a car that was completely burned and melted out, and it was in gravel. There was no fire accelerant. There was no fire coming down from West Maui above the Lahaina Luna, although very anomalous, never been seen before. Eastern winds were coming down from the mountain. Almost always it's coming in off the coast or from side to side, but never down from the top of West Maui. So there's another coinky dink. Let's let them all add up and you guys be the judge. So this realtor's going around to all these sites where you still can, 
by the way, now they're putting up a great big black fence that nobody can climb over. Oh, yes. The whole area is going to be cordoned off. I think it's because of the body count. You think it's the body count? Yes, that's one thing I was going to bring up to you about this big fence that we have seen. Uh, yeah. People are labeling it the Biden curtain. <laughs> that's the uh, yeah, sweet well, I name. Yeah, why hide so much? <laughs> yeah, so there, there's miles and miles of this black fence going up, and it's obscure, obscuring the ground zero area, and it, no one could take any photos of what's going on. And uh, FEMA also sending letters out there banning citizens from uh, doing anything or even the government from doing anything in terms of the media so it's gone uh, silent it has gone silent and for good reason because if journalists were allowed into old lahaina town right there would just be so so many telltale signs that this was a very much controlled burn although it did get out of control uh, but there were some houses that miraculously survived michael i wonder Many of them had blue roofs. So what's what's this about the color blue? Because the blue umbrellas didn't burn. There were a couple blue cars that didn't burn, yet they're melted all around. I saw that. What, what was that all about? I didn't get a chance to read uh, anything like that, but I did see photographs of these blue roofs. Yeah, that didn't burn. Funny that. Or if they had solar panels. Solar panels are off the grid. Solar paneled homes do not need a smart meter. This was something that really puzzled me about the Paradise fires. And I did go and investigate that whole area of Paradise, where the fire started from, where it came from, how it swept over the whole Mesa of Paradise, California, and kept going on down towards Chico, where it was finally tamed. Oh, yeah. But in Paradise, Michael, it, the, the photos are so telling because many of those homes still have their trees around them, but the houses were reduced to rubble. Just like 9-11. Just like 9-11. It just reduced to a pile of white dust. And this is so anomalous with the way houses would burn in a normal forest fire. You'd still get a pretty good heap of stuff, including a lot of metal. But in, in the case of coffee, Park fire, which I went to a couple weeks after that burned in Santa Rosa, Michael bent girders of steel and yeah, molten that's the aluminum. Sign. That's the sign right there. Yeah, no, I, right there. I cracked off a piece of aluminum, still have it as a souvenir, bubbling. So not just at the melting point of 1300 for aluminum, but so hot that it starts boiling too. So again, heat is the giveaway here. And in the case of Paradise, I was really puzzled because some of those houses, it didn't appear that they got hit directly by a dew. So what was that accelerant? And now it's coming out that homes that are off the grid and do not have smart meters, they were spared. But what they're finding out now with these smart meters is they can backflow a current back into a property and light up all the electrical, all the wiring course you only do that when you have the cover of a big fire going on and oh it's just mm. another house got consumed but i think they backflowed the smart meters in lahaina too and we're hitting it from all vectors also with do weapons probably arsonists too we're up there just dumping gasoline and getting the fire going yeah making sure it happens yeah and making sure it happens because the reason it's being fenced off now is it's a massive crime scene and they are covering up the evidence and will be soon bulldozing everything left and then rebuilding Lahaina into a new kind of capital, not the sovereign nation of the Hawaiian people who were having a separatist movement and wanted to get out of the U.S. Right. It's a strange, uh, strange coincidence of timing. Their capital is Lahaina. Yeah, very, very unusual. Very unusual. So here we go. All these coincidences. Oh, really? So there are still over 4,500 displaced without homes. They're not allowed back in. They can't get over the black fence. Yikes. And Yeah. And, and they had to basically been staying with friends or camping out while FEMA was put up in thousand a night room hotels down in Waialea. Yeah. The CEO's living that, large, I read. Living large, yeah, sure are. Wow, that whole budget. Yet, you know what the offer was per family who got burned out of Lahaina from FEMA? $700. $700, that's it. That's it. Wow. 
That's not even one night in the Grand Valley. <laughs> yeah. So it is it, just so blatant how extreme they've gone to get these people out. Now, here's just a little background on Lahaina, Michael. As I said, it was the capital of ancient Hawaii. The kings lived there. They had a Hayao temple, which is now gone, but there are Hayao temples throughout all of Hawaii, which is the ceremonial center. I did a series of books on sacred places. And in my book, Sacred Places North America, I featured Hawaii of these Hayao sites. They're very spiritual people. They're pantheistic. They're kind of like Hindus where they have literally hundreds of gods, some of the most potent being Pele of the volcano. And then there were others who uh, personify the mana, the living spirit in all of us. Right. And this is why Lahaina was this central crossroads. Not only is the island of Lanai, which is almost wholly owned by Oracle's founder, Larry Ellison, but Molokai, which is on its way to Oahu. So you have very safe harbor here. So after the very first mariners came there in 1820, and they were a motley crew, they were just coming off of uh, whaling and sealing ships as merchant marines, and they instantly took a liking to the Hawaiian women and rapidly spread a lot of diseases, including Hansen's disease, which is leprosy. And there was a colony on the island of Molokai totally separated off from everybody where they would just bring the lepers uh -huh. and just drop off on the shore and they would have to fend for themselves. I suppose and they a had Belgian a, priest named Bob yeah. Damien died there looking after him. I suppose they had too, too much of a good time out there. <laughs> too much of a good time. Just like San Francisco oh, old yeah. city was known as the Barbary coast. So was Lahaina. And so these sailors were coming in there, spreading diseases. The rats were jumping off the ship and decimating the land birds of Hawaii and also being able to uh, uh, get, get the, the birds in the trees even. So then they had the great idea. Well, let's introduce mongoose, no. which eat rats. Yes. And then the mongoose also decimated the native bird, more endangered species on the Hawaiian Islands than any other state in the Union because how badly white people screwed it up. So after the Mariners, who kept continually coming back, uh, Herman Melville, who wrote the book Moby Dick, I believe he's buried there. Maybe it's his brother, but there's a very historic graveyard in Lahaina where other notables were. But on the heels of the merchant Marines were the preachers. And those preacher families, uh, very popular names, the main one in Lahaina was the Baldwin family, and they are huge landowners. They were the ones that started developing and putting in the sugarcane and the pineapple fields and other uh, families of the original preachers that came to convert the Hawaiians, which they did. Hawaii is a very religious Christian state now kind of like the way they have made most of the Native American tribes on the mainland, uh, pretty devout Christian people. So the landholders lived in Lahaina, not only the Baldwin family, but the historic Hawaiian families all lived there. That's why this fire was so devastation to the, the sovereign nation right. movement, because they basically lost entire generations, kids, parents, grandparents, even great grandparents would all live together. And now they've all gone missing. 4,500 are now displaced and thousands more still no trace. Nobody knows what happened to them. Gone, including 1,500 of them being children. Michael, just on the island of Lanai across the Lahaina Roads sea channels, 187 is the latest body count have washed ashore on the island of Lanai. Damn. That's the official narratives even saying has died. That is They're crazy. At least saying 109 have pa perished. No, this is in the thousands. Yeah, that is really sad. And the media is not really even talking about this. No, they wish to blow it over and move on to the next news story because so many people are seeing what this is all about and being quite upset about the whole affair that there is a contingent within our government that is attacking itself. You see, China or Russia, who also has directed energy weapons and a lot of other very exotic energy weapons, I call them, and I describe them in my book, Futurist Tarek, 
If they did it to us, that would be an act of war and it'd be all over the news. But when you do it to yourself, when you do it to your own country, men, then you can get away with it. Right. But now the gig is up and more and more people are saying Maui is the new 9-11, even bigger than 9-11. Right. And people always, always wonder and often think like they say stuff like, well, you know, how'd they get away with it? Or, you know, it's going to take so many people to orchestrate this sort of thing. It's, someone's going to talk. And, you know, most of the time they rely on us to self-censor ourselves. Yeah. Well, those are the people that are on the margins that are starting to come over and see things for what they are. And one of the biggest defenses this cabal has had on attacking its own people is that nobody would believe it. Why would our own people do it? Well, there's bad elements. You see, now we're starting to understand that several of these alphabet agencies are now captured operations, that they are controlled by the black hats, this cabal deep state really run by globalists. Look, BlackRock and Vanguard, biggest corporations in the world, which control all the other corporations and nobody knows who owns them, not entirely. So this is what they do. The great researcher, Anthony Hilder said 25 years ago that the CIA is nothing but the enforcement arm of the globalists, of the Council on Foreign Relations, these think tanks of very wealthy net worth individuals who are calling the shots behind the scenes. So they had a very clear directive that they had to get rid of these old landowning families in Lahaina, as well as being able to develop Lahaina the way they want to, because it was a historic town and no development was allowed. In fact, a big uh, high rise plan was just scrapped for that very reason. So now they're getting to bulldoze the whole thing and start the way they want to. That's right. And Another some say, coincidence? Um, well, right. Yes. And some say smart cities and fires are linked together and we will see what the government does roll out over in uh, Maui. We shall wait and see my friend. And furthermore, <laughs> furthermore, I was just going to ask you when it comes to the idea of history sort of repeating itself, Brad, it's a topic that's been debated for such a long time. Some argue that history does indeed follow patterns, while others believe that each era is, you know, unique to itself and shaped by its own circumstances. I'm wondering, what do you think? Do you think this is all just comes, history's repeating itself or a bit of, um, bit of both the concept of cycles in history, um, sort of, it's like a reoccurring theme that's been going on. Uh, forever, Brad. Yeah, kind of the fall of the Roman Empire, just a slow burn where it took a lot of circumstances over a good period of time, but everybody saw it coming, uh, even over multiple generations, until it finally just fully imploded on itself. Right. But now we got high technology involved, so the stakes are much higher than the time of the Roman Empire. An oppressive element that's very wicked and very evil that is moving towards this one world government construct. Right. Neo-fascism that is really showing itself as holding nothing back. There is no sacred cow to them. They'll do anything for their agenda. Just like we saw in the East Palestine derailment earlier this year that totally toxified an area of Western um, Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, where East Palestine was, there's a, a, a dastardly agenda there too. Not only is that the heart of Amish country, West Pennsylvania, Dutch, uh, they're off the grid. They grow organically. They don't want to be a part. They don't get the V. And oh, by the way, no incidents of autism whatsoever. No autism. Steve Kirsch is offered a bounty. Yeah, you find me one Amish kid with autism, I'll pay you $50,000. Wow. And, and nobody stepped forward. Yeah, funny that. Interesting, I never knew that. Hmm. So East Palestine is a ticking time bomb. It's, it's very toxic. Once again, you don't hear anything about that. But isn't it interesting in the bylaws of these 15-minute cities, which Cleveland, Ohio, is set to be our first one, the first prototype. 
in the bylaws, it says if you live on toxified land and the EPA deems it unlivable, you have to move to the nearest city. And then they're just going to stack them and pack them in these apartments. Like Jim Willie says, they're going to be ro moach hotels. People are going to check in all the time and live there for a period and then just be gone. And then the new people move in. So this is very devious, this plan they have to get us all locked down in our cities. And you can read the writing on the wall, Michael. It's all in the works. And this is oh, part of coming. why they burned out Maui. Oh, it's coming. But don't worry. Don't worry. You know, it's all part of um, this was all fueled by uh, climate change, though, according to uh, John Podesta. <laughs> oh, he's a trustworthy source. Yeah, Mr. Uh, I believe him. It's a gate guy. Yeah, he's he's right on. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness and also uh i think the uh hawaii electric company is also being sued by the way for their, well, that's for the their cover, mishandling just like it was here in california michael with pg and e taking the fall but uh deborah Tavares, great researcher looked into who owns pg and e and after you go through all these uh corporate and shell companies and vanguards and blackrock who really owns it she was able to determine it's none other than the rothschilds no, Control there they are. The interest of PG and E. So if they're directing the fire burnout, then they can be the fall guy. And oh, by the way, PG and E went bankrupt, and so therefore can't do all the payouts that they owe. So they even give themselves an out. So yeah, I'm sure it'll come out that this uh, Hawaii Electric Power Company is also tied into some of these globalist interests. Someone's gonna someone's going to jail for this. That's the way it well, seems if like. Well, there's justice in the <laughs> world, me. they have to. Someone needs to go to jail for this. Yeah. And uh, furthermore, Brad. More than just jail. <laughs> this is maybe a, uh, to the gas polls right after and, they've been tried, and convicted. And what what a increasingly frail society we live in, meaning well, it, that we're so also dependent upon uh, these old archaic power grids and telecommunication networks for nearly every aspect of our lives and if one thing goes wrong ooh, it it the the proverbial shit hits the fan in a big way right cascading effect and but that's also happening in in the way of the uh, great awakening michael i do believe that we're seeing more and more and more people waking up not just every year every month every week every day more people are starting to see what a friggin' scam it's all about, that these so-called conspiracy theories are all coming true, are all coming to pass. Look, I write a book, a uh, three-book series on esoteric subjects, which means all that has been withheld from humanity and only known by a select few. And Michael, I can't tell you how many chapters and passages I have that are now coming true. And well, known by the general population. They've always been true, but now widely regarded. And it actually changes the meaning of the word to exoteric. Mm. Once everybody in the world starts to understand something, it's no longer esoteric. It's no longer known by a select few. So, so many of these things, especially regarding these false flags and how nothing adds up, uh, even people who would not be inclined to think that way that have just followed the mainstream media their entire lives are coming around, Michael, and starting to see that something ain't right here. Yeah, it's slowly happening. There was a time when this dialogue would seem far-fetched, but in 2023, nothing is off the table. No, and I think 2024 is even going to be more off the table. Oof. This is the period they're going for their full court press. Ah, this yes. is the time frame. They've speeded it up. Yeah. Because next year is this very contentious election, and it's, they know it's getting Mr. ugly. T gets in there, it's game over, one hundred percent. Well, it's getting for, ugly already, for, as you've seen the Trump mugshot that's become uh, famous. It's uh, the most viewed photo ever, I right. think. And the more they indict, the more his base gets excited. <laughs> I agree. Because he just gets more popular every time they do that. Exactly. Now I want to vote for him. <laughs> it makes me want to you, vote for him even more. Exactly. Me too. So I think I don't this back like his view on some of this. I'll tell you, Michael. Right? But the more they do to him, the more I can see how much the deep state fears him and will go at no cost to try to cut him off. You know, because if they do land one felony charge, he is ineligible from running. 
Right, and so that's the whole goal. Get them on one of the, what is it, 61 or 71 new trumped up charges that are against him added to the this already nine yeah already to the 93 that he has over him right good lord which has never happened to a other single ex-president in history until trump well that's because they're all clean brad so they never done anything wrong hmm. right strange no, they went wrong with the plan and this exactly. is what people are coming around to see is that the united states is a captured organization look we've got or we should, I should say we had a rock solid constitution until the act of 1871 that made the United States a corporation. And I outline this in great detail and beyond esoteric in the neo-fascist section, because people have to understand what happened to this great country. How was it that we got hijacked and how did some of these le alphabet agency, let three letter agencies turn on the American people? Well, they're the enforcement arm. That's what they're told to do. And these globalists are calling the shots. And this is the real enemy here. And they'll always deflect it to anything or anyone and start a war somewhere. That's a good way to deflect it. But people are waking up and seeing that this is the real enemy, foreign and domestic. The barbarians are inside the gate, Michael. That's right. That's right. Um. For those who want to learn more, you know, you just look into the trilateral trilateral commission and uh, you'll start to see uh, things for what they really are. Um, but furthermore, Brad, President Biden, you know, he's always making the waves, sure. as you know. And of course, this time he's asking Congress for more funds to develop a new COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> oh, where do I line up for my next cabal issue? Are you going to get your Black booster? <laughs> oh, but it's safe and effective, right? Well, that's what they claim. Now, even the CDC, in their own words, have said that they did not prevent transmission and they did not make it so that you would be more immune to another variant. CDC admitted there was nothing good that came out of it. All these promises, we were told, sold down the river. This is another way people are waking up, Michael, because those who have gotten it are starting to feel the effects and seeing that something ain't right, that they got slipped a mickey, as they <laughs> used to say in Ireland, when you put something in someone's drink, you knock them out. Oh, yes. And that's what happened to, to uh, most of America. We were slipped one of those. Yeah, it's a great hoodwinking. And it's so many different ways, not just medical, not just false flags. Uh, but really, from cradle to grave, we have been sold a false narrative. Yeah, we've been sold down the river a long time ago, sadly. And, um, and it's going to happen again, uh, Brad. Uh, I hate to cut you off, but I think it's going to happen again. They want to sort of bring back uh, COVID again. They want, they want to bring back the lockdowns. Yeah, isn't that just insane? And put masks on again? For what? Haven't we been fooled already? They want to do that out here in California, <laughs> more specifically. I'm seeing well, the news around out here. I escaped. California. I don't see anything good coming out of that government. You're not staying out here anymore, are you, Brad? I'm out of the state. You're out of the I'm state. The yeah, maybe that's for the best. Yeah, I uh, want to stay away from population centers. I was already seeing the writing on the wall in San Francisco and Santa Cruz, where I was living just before here. And uh, what these blue policies do. I can't even believe you were living in San Francisco for any time. Oh, yeah, for 25 years. Lord, why so long, Brad? Well, it's a beautiful city. It was called the Paris of the Pacific. It's, I like the climate, the fog in the summer. I kind of like it cooler, but I'm out here in 90 degree Nevada today. And hey, I just came from the swimming pool and that felt pretty good. Yeah, that's always nice. You get, you get used to your environment, heading up to Burning Man in a couple of days and oh, yeah. check that out this weekend. Yeah, Burning that's Man. my neighborhood now. Yeah, Burning Man. You know, interesting enough, I think there were some climate change activists who were blocking the road up to Burning <laughs> Man just recently, and they, they got kicked out right away, but not without causing like a 10-mile delay. Yeah, I wish they would have been protesting the chemtrails, which are the large <laughs> cause of global warming but now they're taking a line out of the uh cabal playbook or just attention grabbers misguided as so many of those protests were look i saw what antifa and blm did to san francisco and many places like union square the big shopping district 
they gutted it. And the police just stood back and allowed it to happen. Uh, now it's a retail apocalypse. Those remaining stores that didn't get looted but are having flash mobs come and rip them off. And if you steal under $1,000, the cops aren't going to enforce it. Now the retail apocalypse has begun. And Market Street and Union Square and the Westfield Mall, they just all packed it up and closed it up. Now you're having all the uh, office space not being rented out or companies pulling out of expensive San Francisco and the housing bubble is going to be next. So I suppose, it's a constant um, boom cycle. It has been ever since the Barbary Coast years. And uh, right now it's still very expensive. $3,000 a month for a one bedroom. Damn, that is stiff. It seems like I'm actually missing out on some free handouts. Uh, I just go and uh, steal them now. <laughs> Yeah, I think African Americans are getting approved for uh, half a million dollars or something ridiculous. Uh, if you can prove that you've lived in San Francisco since 1995, and oh, these are reparations from the years of slavery, Michael. What if I identify as being black? Hey, you might be able to tap into that. Not too shabby if you can, just like they're repatriating Holocaust survivors and their families. What a world we live in. What the right. hell? What the hell happened to uh, America, Brad? Where, it where did it go wrong? Or this is the <sighs> downfall of capitalism: is these rich psychopaths can come to control everything, and then they can implement their sick agendas, like this burnout of Maui to put in their smart island, fifteen-minute city. Oh, uh, my God. It's disgusting. And yes, we also have reports of uh, people wanting to buy land right away over in Maui and disgusting the, the, the citizens out there. Yeah, they're, they're, the, the big fire. There are several others. And by the way, I was on um, with Nino Rodriguez for a couple of days after the fire and was describing how the other wildfires on the Hawaiian Islands were in a long line from the big island to East Maui, up country, there were some fires, and then the big one on Lahaina, and then additional ones on uh, Oahu. And it was it was almost perfect straight line, like a dew plane was flying over a satellite and just zapping them from above. Yeah, that's that's very Eight suspicious. Flips. Yes. Highly suspicious, I should say. Up. Now, they just lit up another one in Kanapali, which is the neighboring resort community. Oh, and then FEMA was there on the spot. And they were putting people up, and they are putting out the wildfires, and sirens were screaming. So let's just go over a little list of all the other anomalies that did not happen, most especially the night of 8-8 uh, Lionsgate. That is a, a sacred number uh, that, that has been, uh, once again, inverted. They do like to take that which is good and invert it into evil or darkness. And so 8-8 Lionsgate is when it lit up. That's when boats were on fire out in port. This has never happened before either. But what happened that, that uh, afternoon when it started and then the real death toll was that night. But the fires in Lahaina burned until uh, the 11th. But miraculously on the 10th, Michael, the first book about climate change and the fires on Hawaii came out on 810. Now, how do you do that? I'm a book publisher Magic. and I'm a writer and I work on this stuff all the time. You don't come out with a book in two days while the fires are still burning. There's another one. So let's talk about what happened that, that day and that evening. First of all, the kids were sent home. <clears throat> they had just started school. Uh, many of the parents rushed home and families died together. But but sometimes the parents survived and still haven't found their kids. Then there were uh, the, the water system. They've even admitted this, that they turned off the water. Now, how do you fight a fire uh, if you don't have water? Right. No, no sirens, no fire trucks came to the scene. They just let it burn. The cops were holding up the traffic in the burn zone. And a lot of people died in their cars when the fire swept over Front Street. And... The other strange thing is they have one of the most elaborate alarm systems just in case of tsunamis, but can be used for any emergency. No alarm systems rung, no alarms, no sirens of fire trucks. People that were there said the silence was deafening. 
it was so strange that this fire was just allowed to burn on mm. without any response. Now they lit another one up in Kalahari and there are fire trucks there and they put it out right away. And the couple of houses that burned, they got those people. Oh, the FEMA was all over that just to show that they're, oh, super nice guys like Oprah Winfrey in uh, one of the, the halls. She's got a huge spread up and up country and bought all these other acres. Uh, oh, but we're going to give some money once we find out uh, when all this settles how we can rebuild. So she's already admitting that they're working on this this rebuild of Lahaina the way the globalists want it. And this is just so upset the Hawaiian people. They all know, and they are so upset uh, that uh, this is going to have long-term ramifications, just like 9-11. Oh, yeah. But this time around, Michael, we all recognize it straight away. Oh, yes. We've seen this pattern before. As I said, we've seen this sort of thing before, especially if you were a native out here in California and you've been following all the wildfires that have been going on out here for the last several years. I even know people that own property out in the middle of, of uh, nowhere out in Northern California. And even they had their suspicions that all of it has been orchestrated since the beginning. Orchestrated from the beginning, and the the rate that they killed and the weaponry they used uh, is just taking it to the next level. How devious and wicked these individuals are that perpetrated this, these oh, yes. globalists. And that's about uh, 2,170 acres of land in Lahaina was burned, which is being mm. uh, reported here. Yeah. It's a lot of land. It Practically the entire town burned down, hundreds of homes gone, uh, more fire similar to those on Maui were happening, and on the mainland. So let's talk about the mainland fires, because this is when I was originally tipped off that these wildfires uh, were burning out of control. Two summers ago, up in Lake Tahoe, where I love to go skiing, they had the uh, fire that burned over the entire crest of the Sierra Mountain Range. Never happened before in the history of fires. And it happened not once, but it also happened uh, north of the Sierras, uh, the very northern part of the Sierra Mountains. It also burned over uh, and did it twice. But to set it up, and this is also true on the Hawaiian Islands, huge amount of chemtrailing activity. So much so that on, on the Hawaiian Islands, I know of organic farmers such as uh, David Avocado, they can't grow organic seeds because there's so much aluminum, barium, strontium, and these other chemicals and minerals that are being dropped that uh, are defoiling the soil. Oh, but by the way, Monsanto has aluminum resistant seeds. Ah. So you could buy those and start a garden. They think yeah. of everything, don't they? They think of everything. <laughs> and in the case of California, they have made the forests start to die. Of course, they blamed it on the drought, and then they said the pine nut beetles, I believe is the name, that they're getting in there because the trees are dying and they're exacerbating the problem. That was the dumbest thing I've ever heard, by the way. Yeah, it is the dumbest thing you've ever heard because in no part of that official narrative do you hear about the extensive chemtrailing that's, right. that's been going on since the mid-1990s and is making these forests like kindling. So when they send over one of these dues, and by the way, they busted, the Department of Justice owns a plane that runs out of uh, central Oregon. This is also where Evergreen Air, many of the tankers that fly the chemtrail routes also fly out of there for the West Coast. But this particular one, just the last few weeks, when all the fires in Northern California and Oregon started, they found the route map of this Department of Justice issued plane, but was operated, they're saying, by the FBI, and the route it flew, Michael, is exactly where all these new fires just started up. So they're just flying over and hitting it with a dew and letting it burn. They do it when the conditions are right. They do it when there is a heavy wind, preferably a dry wind that comes out of the east. And me as a skier, I know this, that when the dry winds blow across the deserts of Nevada, and Oregon and uh, Washington State, there's big desert areas there, that, that it's going to be a dry wind and it can be very cold in the winter. 
Southern California, you guys call it the Santa Ana winds, these dry winds out of the east. Right. Perfect conditions for starting wildfires, and that's when they light them up. So I'd say you guys are probably going to get some this soon autumn. Oh, yeah. Yes. And the Santa Ana's kick in. And that's what they were saying, actually. A firefighter was just saying that. And the captain was saying, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but there was a fire not so long ago out here. And he was saying something along the lines of, um, it's going to happen again soon. It was kind of like a threat almost. Yeah, yeah. The predictive programming. How would they know that? Well, first of all, if you drive up to the Sierras, but I've also seen it in the Cascadia region all the way up to BC, Canada, which is now burning. And then all in the Rockies, when you get above about 3000 feet, you start to notice that all the conifer trees, all the pine trees are stressed. And if you look carefully, they have brown needles among the green needles. Some of them are just outright in the stage of dying and whole hillsides will be speckled brown with dead trees. Dane Wigington from Geoengineering Watch has done a lot of water samples and all over the decades and finding that this particulate aluminum is the real cause of the trees uh, dying because he'll also take samples of the tree sap and of the trees itself and finding these trace aluminum minerals, just like with humans. If we get an overabundance of trace heavy metals in our body, it's very hard to get it out and it's very uh, dangerous to the body. So it's killing these trees because there is no more drought. We just had two monster winters, especially last winter, Michael, when all the ski resorts set records for the highest amount of snowfall. The rivers are still pumping out here and there's still uh, snow up in the mountains that is melting. So they don't have the excuse of calling it a drought anymore or the pine nut beetles. They uh, are now just saying, well, things are dry. It's climate change. It's climate change, yeah. And we could just blame it on that. And that's what a lot of people are doing. And that's what uh, that's even what NPR is saying. And even the National Guard are saying hotter climate means it's the climate change and a right. never ending it's fire not- season. That's what they're that the National Guard is even saying, which is pretty wild just to hear them say that. And of course, in um, what was it? I think it was in 2020, we lost about 4 million acres due to fires, by the way, Brad. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, the worst may be yet to come. That's what I'm afraid of. In the forests in Northern California and Oregon and Washington and BC should be burning up right now. They just had a monster winter. The soil is still damp enough to prevent the fires from moving. And the, the plant life is very verdant and very wet. But still, these fires are happening. Oh, yes, it's, it's happening. And by the way, out, out in uh, El Centro, 117 was the high, by the way, today. Woo. Wow. How do you deal with it? I <laughs> have no clue. You hide inside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you hook a fan up next to you, and that's how you live your life. So you know how this summer, they said July went down in history as the hottest summer in, in America? That's right. And in July, they, the... By the way, the Weather Channel, Deborah Tavares also found out through all these different corporate uh, ways and means and shell companies is also owned by the Rothschilds. Hmm. And so they control the narrative and they control the ways and the means and the, the paycheck for these captured operations. So I'm sure get paid very, very well. They're paying But they can very fly good. rail tankers without pilots anymore, too. They can be fully remote by drone flown to do these routes. And in my... Uh, book Future Esoteric, I show one of the routes over the East Coast where they're just zigzagging back and forth. What plane ever does that? When you see the curly cue in the sky, what airline or jet does a U-turn ever? Not one you want to and fly with. Is, oh, oh, we forgot some luggage back <laughs> in SFO. We better turn it around. Absolutely. And as I said earlier, and as you were alluding to right as we got this conversation started, Some say smart cities and fires are linked together, and in 2008, the Hawaiian government also launched the Clean Energy Initiative, by the way. Hmm. And of course, that was also funded and controlled by the WEF. Interesting that. There they are again. You you just just have to just scratch your head and wonder what's going on and what's going to be rolling in a town in Maui soon here. We will find out what happens, and those will be... 
that's those are the people we should be pointing our fingers at. Whoever <laughs> buys up that land is guilty, Brad. Yeah, well, the state's moving in too. The the governor's already said, <laughs> and he's uh, chomping at the bit to get his plans in there uh, for a smart city and to make this the new world economic globalist type forum city. I wouldn't be surprised if they hosted WEF. Yeah, some, powerful, some, powerful, uh, some powerful men and women live there, Brad, so it wouldn't be uh, anything I would uh, bat an eye at. No, you wouldn't. And it's similar to the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado. My dad lived a number of years in Aspen and went out to see him quite a bit. And in the summer, they do their institute, and it's the globalist think tank. I actually describe all the globalist groups in Beyond Esoteric. You mentioned the Trilateral Commission. That's oh, yeah. when they bridged the gap over the Pacific and brought in the Japanese. That's their secret society, but with our globalists and the Europeans. That's right. But you have the Bilderberger Group in, in, in Europe every year, and you have the think tanks such as the Council on Foreign Relations here, which uh, remember Hillary Clinton was giving a talk at the CFR in Washington, D.C., and she said, I'm so glad you've moved an office to Washington, D.C., <laughs> so I don't have to travel to New York all the time to get my directive. So she's even admitting that they're puppets. Talking to points, globalists. right. Yeah. Mm. It's a crazy world we live in, and it makes you wonder who really is in charge, if not our so, or not, if, if not the quote-unquote elected officials. No, 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 no. They're puppets too, bought right. and paid for, just like the judges. But you were mentioning all of the states that were fighting strangely lit wildfires on land that was planned for the smart cities. Oh, yeah. And I just came upon a, a, a list here. Nevada, right now, three wildfires. Wyoming, two. Oklahoma, one. Idaho, nine. Colorado, 16 wildfires right now. Montana, 22. Washington, 23. Florida, near Orlando, one. Well, that's going to get blown out with this directed hurricane. They're steering right into the Tampa Bay area. But even New Jersey, two. Oregon, 27 wildfires right now. Very suspiciously started. New Mexico, 14. California, 35. Mississippi, four. Utah, seven. And a smart city was already dedicated to the land in S South Salt Lake City, mm. where the state prison used to be. They already have towns and plans where one of these fires is near Portland, Oregon. Portland's one of the on the list. So all of these that uh, states I just named have at least one city that already has the plans in the works to create a smart city, a 15-minute city, where you will not have a car. You can only walk or ride a bike about 15 miles of your radius. If you go outside your radius, they'll be able to social credit score you and ding you for venturing out. So <laughs> let alone get in your car and drive because uh, they're building. There's a guy that was just recording in Toronto, Canada of all these new builds, which are these skyscrapers with housing above it, some office or retail on the lower but in the, the area where you'd normally have a parking garage, they're not building parking spaces anymore. Huh, funny that. It's like they anticipate nobody's going to own a car anymore and be happy. Interesting. Very interesting and very telling. Very telling. Too telling. Too telling. It's this is in the works. It's not that, oh, they might do this. Oh, it's, it's underway. It's already happening. It's happening, yeah. There. My God, and all this is currently going on in real time, and this is why I say, are you prepared, ladies and gentlemen, for when the shit hits the fan? Well, if you were about to say, get some storable food or <laughs> start getting all the stuff you need, here's another thing, Michael. We know with the BRICS have just announced their currency that uh, many think will be based a gold-backed currency that's coming out on November 1st. It's the death blow to any fiat currency. That's why there's no gold or silver or commodity-backed currency at the moment, because you cannot compete in a fiat currency environment with anything based on real wealth. So as soon as a wealth-based currency comes out, it's the death to the fiat. So what does that mean for Americans? Well, we're still going to have to buy stuff. 
And if it's made here in America, it might not go up that much. But economist Jim Willie said anything imported, consider it to be quadrupled, maybe 10 times what you're used to paying for it. So all the cheap stuff from China, this might be the last couple weeks or months that you can still get stuff out of, say, Walmart without it being four times more expensive Yikes. a year from now. Yikes. Yeah, that's, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing. We need our uh, really cheap Chinese products to stay cheap, Brad. Get them now. Get them now. With it. Yeah, <laughs> we well, can. Just in Walmart yesterday, I had to make a return, but I got uh, oil and an oil filter for my car and a jack to put it up. Start thinking about how to be DIY. You're going to have to because I'm telling you, we depend on the electrical grid for everything. And and I'm one of those people, though, Brad, you know, if the electrical grid goes out, I'm doomed. I mean, I can't really do all that much without uh, depending on electricity. And furthermore, the electrical grid is incredibly old and vulnerable to failure. In fact, Brad, I'm not sure if you even know this, but much of the infrastructure was built in the mid 20th century, if I recall correctly. It's almost like we're getting set up for... I'm telling uh, you, this shit is failure. insane. It is insane. Look, every country with a modern army has EMP weapons. Oh, yeah. That's electromagnetic pulse waves. And you can take out an entire grid system in a, in a you know, drive by. You see where those uh, stations are. You hit that with an EMP and then boom, a whole city goes down. Uh, and then you keep hitting them and they could take out whole states, whole regions, maybe even the whole country. Michael, we heard about all these military age Chinese people coming over the border. Right. And Michael Yan and others who were watching their movement said that they already had tickets, passport, what in some cases uh, fake identities, but more importantly, they had a place to go. So they're thinking these are sleeper cells. These are guys who are waiting for their orders, and when the CCP says take down the grid, they have operatives in all these areas that they can do an EMP. Remember Nikola Tesla, he created many of these technologies, including the direct energy weapon. He called it the death ray, and he did not want some of this to get out. He also invented this little handheld device, which he tested on a steel girder building that was under construction. And it basically amplifies its own waves. So you get it started, and then he, he put it magnetically, stuck it to one of the girders to see what it would do. It very nearly almost took the building down. Everybody was getting off of there thinking it was a major earthquake until yeah. he pulled the device off and wow. stopped it. Yeah, and then, so this is basically a prototype for an EMP, is that you can pulse this energy wave into an electrical grid substation and it'll just fry itself out. I'm telling you, people don't understand what we're seeing here in terms of how old all of this uh, equipment really is. There, haven't, there hasn't really been any updates to any of it. And, and, and by design. And by design, yes. And a long-term power outage would really F us up. Oh, yeah. And then imagine how quickly the supermarket shelves would be empty. Oof. I was in uh, I was in Santa Cruz for the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, and I had just moved out there, and I felt the earthquake. Uh, we were only about 20 miles from the epicenter. Oh shit! And I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> I see these ripples coming down the road, and yeah. I'm laying down like, "This is a force of nature. This is the coolest thing I've ever experienced." But the, the light poles were shaken, and we thought, oh, boy, these are going to jump off the line and create fires, which they did. Then uh, we walked to a park nearby with my girlfriend at the time and uh, her sister and her, his boyfriend. We were about to go out and play basketball. We walked over to the park, and then we saw the plumes of smoke coming out of downtown Santa Cruz. We're like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, people died. This is serious. So then we immediately went to go get some stuff. And within an hour of that earthquake, Michael, supermarket shelves were bare or just looted because the power goes out and the employees, uh, they might not have the wherewithal to lock up the doors nor have the screens to break uh, windows. Mm. 
it was gone within an hour. Yeah, I've been experiencing something like that. Is it's pretty traumatic in one way or another, and um, it is also a cool sight to see that ripple effect. And I myself saw that back in 2010, Brad. The great Easter quake that happened out here, that happened in Baja, Mexico. There's a 7.2, they claim. Oh, wow. But at the time, I saw 7.3 on my app. And, um, you know, I was getting really into uh, Planet X around uh, 2010, and I thought, holy shit, it's happening now. <laughs> I'm like, Nubiru's hero. Yeah, and California is known for earthquake country. By the way, that can be triggered remotely as well. That's Another what I read, Another one yeah. of the dubious functions of the Harp Array which oh, yes. also steer the clouds, the chemi clouds that they spray. When you see the ripple in those white milky fake clouds, uh, sometimes within hours of them spraying, when those clouds turn to a ripple, sort of you'd see in a shallow end in uh, the ocean, that rippling is a telltale sign that they're steering those clouds. They're using weather as a weapon, as a way to move whatever system these psychopathic geoengineers have in mind oh yes as the weather warfare continues brad and i see we've been on here for a little bit of time but um brad you know i do want to thank you for being a part of the program here i can easily talk to you for another hour uh without a hitch here but i don't want to take up too much of your time brad i respect your time and i know you are a busy man my friend so definitely uh, give us a, a bit of an update of uh, anything that you're going to be doing here soon, aside from the Burning Man sort of <laughs> festival. But then again, if you want to go to Burning Man, you could probably find Brad out there. Yeah, Kruder and Dorfmeister Thursday night at the opulent temple stage. There will surely be a Brad sighting among that crowd. And by the way, Brad, are you are you rolling up alone or are you going with like a, do you got like a group? What's going on? Uh, yeah, I'm going with a buddy who just... Uh, basically got some discounted tickets it's actually oh, okay. a good year to pick up discounted tickets okay nice. or free. Um, free and we're gonna split the costs and head up there it's not too much and that's why i'm uh deciding to make my triumphant return after 11 years damn go check but meeting up with some friends and yeah we got some people to camp by and stay hydrated by the way oh yeah well i live out here now so i'm in uh burning man country already oh, yeah, you're kind of used to it and I, so yeah i get used to it it's super fun. You, you should definitely come next year. David Nino Rodriguez wants to go next year, too. Maybe we'll we get a bunch of us from the alt media and do, uh, yeah, do a show out there. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, so, Brad, yes. Uh, well, one, yeah, once again, I, yes, sir. I do want to thank you for being a part of the program, Brad, and um, definitely plug anything you'd like before we let you go here. Well, I, I'm also speaking at a couple more conferences this year going to Las Vegas in the middle of September for the alien event, uh, biomed expo at the Alexis all suite resort. Uh, then the very following weekend, I'm heading up to Mount Shasta with Laura Eisenhower. She's going to come by and check out my ranch and she's got some property up in Montana. So we're kind of comparing our notes on how to develop it and make it useful for conferences and small festivals and things like that nice then i speak at the, the light of shasta the following weekend third weekend of september then i'm flying out well i'm producing how weird street fair is the big event that i co-produce in san francisco i still go back and do that once a year and that'll be october 14th and then the following weekend the third weekend of october i'm flying out to orlando florida for the galactic and spiritual informers love it very busy, yeah. it seems that you will be for the rest of the remaining year of uh, 2023 here. And my God, Brad, you are definitely a very busy man. And Brad, again, I would love to talk to you further, but we got to get out of here, my friend. Hey, just like that night we were hanging out of contact in the desert. We went for hours that night. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Hell yeah. But if people want to find out more about my conferences, and there's several others, and I'm starting to get bookings for 2024. Uh, go to bradolson.com. There's a link right on top of the conferences I'll be at. And then if anybody's interested in my books, uh, and you can get a signed copy if they're one of my books off of cccpublishing.com. And many of the things I talked about tonight on the show with you, Michael, I've 
chronicled in my esoteric series of books. Beyond Esoteric, my favorite book of the series. And Brad, you still owe me a book, by the way. And um, I, I plan to get that from you the next time we uh, see each other. Deal. You got, you it, got it. it. Talk to you soon. <laughs> All right, Michael. Thanks so much. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was my guest, Mr. Brad Olson. Definitely go look him up. That's bradolson.com. As we wind down here tonight, again, please keep in mind, sign up for that newsletter if you need updates here on the program over at michaeldeacon.com. And of course, visit our merchandise section. We have the Michael Deacon Program official Trump Thug Life t-shirt. Pick that up yourself. It's a great t-shirt to give to a friend or rock it yourself. I recommend that it. it's the Thug Life meme with the glasses and the joint in Trump's mouth. Quite appropriate, I would say. Whether you love them or hate them, this is a fantastic t-shirt. If you don't want any merchandise and you just want bonus material, please go to patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. I hope you enjoyed the show, boys and girls. I had a blast. I want to thank all of you out there for sticking around and listening to this episode. Those of you who will listen back on the podcast rendition of this program, and those of you right here in the chat room on YouTube, Please like, subscribe, share the episode. And remember, some folks out there don't want you talking about Hawaii. I know so. I've gotten multiple messages saying, stop talking about Hawaii. Can you believe that? Once again, I wish you the very best. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, mahalo.